on World News Tonight. Shaky grounds. A landslide killed at least 12 hikers while they slept at a campsite in Malaysia. Historic walkout. Some 100,000 UK nurses walk off job in first ever strike over pay in the United Kingdom. Further detained. Peru's Castillo jail term extended as protests rage on all over Peru's capital and suburbs. All aboard. Christmas choo-choo train lights up Colombia's capital and passengers are in for a merry ride. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. Now tonight's broadcast covers a wide range of incidents around the globe from natural disasters to political unrest. And we are starting off with a tragic disaster in Malaysia where people have lost lives while on a camping trip with their families. At least 16 people, including children, have been killed after a landslide enveloped a holiday campsite in Malaysia. Families were sleeping in their tents when a landslide happened. Hundreds of rescuers spent Friday digging through the mud to find survivors. More than 90 people had been staying at the base. Local media reported that the farm's managers saying at least 30 children and 51 adults had been registered for an overnight stay. One person was taken to the hospital, was pregnant, while others had injuries ranging from minor cuts to a suspected spinal injury. By Friday afternoon, authorities had rescued more than 60 people, but 17 were still missing. They said local media reported at least one child, a five-year-old boy, had died. Selangor, the country's most affluent state, has been suffering landslides before, often attributed to forest and land clearance. The region is in its rainy season, but no heavy rain or earthquakes were recorded overnight. A year ago, about 21,000 people were displaced by flooding from torrential rain in seven states across the country. The bombardments continue in Ukraine. All districts of Kyiv are experiencing water supply disruptions. This comes as the EU agreed a fresh round of sanctions on Russia over the war in Ukraine after complaints from hawkish Eastern European leaders that some countries were trying to water them down. Diplomats said that a compromise deal, thought to include targeting some 200 individuals, was reached on the sidelines of a leaders' summit in Brussels and that sanctions would be formally confirmed soon. EU leaders met for the last time in 2022 against the backdrop of continued Russian shelling in Ukraine as their own economies struggle to shoulder the burden of sanctions on Russia. But the summit nevertheless saw the announcement of new funding to Ukraine. We increased our military support for Ukraine by a further 2 billion euros. And we've agreed on an additional 18 billion euros of budgetary assistance money to help pay Ukrainian wages and pensions and keep public services running. More fraught, seemingly, was the adoption of a fresh round of sanctions on Russia. We have adopted a ninth package of sanctions because Russia must pay the price for its unjustified aggression on Ukraine. Parce que la Russie doit payer le prix de son agression injustifiée de l'Ukraine. The latest package, announced on Wednesday, was delayed by wrangling between coastal states Belgium and the Netherlands on the one hand, who felt disproportionately affected by sanctions on fertilisers, and Poland and Lithuania, who were resistant to affording any exemptions. Now adopted, though, the new package blacklists almost 200 individuals and entities, as well as restricting EU investment in Russian mining, a strategic sector, one which attracted around a quarter of the country's foreign investment before the war in Ukraine. As Brussels reels from the so-called Qatargate revelations, leaders heard from the European Parliament president on how to clean up the institution, but were careful to keep their distance from the corruption scandal. Nurses across much of the United Kingdom launched a historic strike as they walked out of hospitals and onto picket lines after several years of falling pay and declining standards left the country's nationalized health care system in a state of crisis. Nurses with the United Kingdom's treasured National Health Service have begun their first labor strike in the nursing union's 106-year history. 
underlining the pressures facing one of the world's premier universal healthcare systems and one of several concurrent strikes hitting major British industries. The NHS enjoys an iconic status in the UK, but its hospitals are stretched thin and face massive backlogs severely worsened by COVID issues. On top of that, the striking nurses say they've suffered a decade of de facto pay cuts. Inflation in the UK has recently reached over 10%, but the government says it can't afford to increase nurse pay by more than 4 or 5%. The union is demanding 19% and says low pay will create more staff shortages with public health on the line. These strikes, however, won't affect some critical areas like dialysis and intensive care. We have to acknowledge that we're only here because we've been pushed to this and there will be further strikes, but we have to acknowledge that we aren't here by choice. Labour disputes this winter have also crippled the UK's rail industry, its postal service and airports are bracing for Christmas disruptions. Prince Harry put his shared bond with Prince William over Princess Diana to one side as he leveled significant allegations against his brother in his Netflix documentary. The new Prince of Wales came off lightly during Harry and Meghan Markle's Oprah Winfrey interview in March 2021, but bore the brunt of fresh allegations in part two of Harry and Meghan. I wonder what would have happened to us had we not gone out when we did. Prince Harry and his wife Meghan are piling fresh criticism on the British royal family in new much-awaited episodes of their Netflix documentary series released on Thursday. In one, Harry accused his brother Prince William of screaming at him during a summit to discuss his future. He also accused William's aides of trading negative stories about the couple with the media. He also blames the pressures of negative tabloids for Meghan's miscarriage. Author of Diana, A Life in Dresses, Claudia Joseph, said that Harry slinging insults at William could have an irreparable effect. It is, as I said, damaging to the brand, the firm and the institution. It's more a general narrative that Harry and Meghan have, have talked about of how they were treated by the royal family. There are no specific instances of they lied here, they did this. There's n so it's slightly difficult for them to rebut anything because it's it's accusing a an institution of treating Meghan differently because of her skin colour. Um, and, it, you know, either people will believe that or people won't believe that. Royal commentator Emily Andrews said that ultimately the documentary won't change anyone's opinion on the Duke and Duchess of Sussex. Most people already have an opinion of Harry and Meghan, and this perhaps won't change people's opinion very much. I mean, if you if you like Harry and Meghan, you're going to watch it and go, oh my God, poor them, this is so awful. If you hate Harry and Meghan, you're going to watch it and go, oh my goodness, what have they just shut up? There's a cost of living crisis going on. But I do think they come across very well, and I think they come across very sympathetically. Both Buckingham Palace and William's office, Kensington Palace, have said they would not be commenting on the documentaries. Kosovo's Prime Minister Albin Kurti submitted a bid for Kosovo to join the European Union, launching a process that could take years, if not decades, and is dependent on its normalizing relations with neighboring Serbia. Kurti presented the application in Prague to the Czech Republic holders of the EU's rotating presidency. In a historic moment for Kosovo, Prime Minister Albin Kurti has submitted a formal application to join the EU. Kosovo is the last country in the Western Balkans to apply to join the bloc. But this is the first step in a long journey ahead, one that will require reforms and economic alignment. It will certainly not be easy. I'm uh, repeating that we want no fast track, we want no back door to EU integration and we want to join EU as soon as possible. I believe that with our dedication and willingness, we are going to change the minds of eventual skeptics as well. The constant tension between Pristina and Serbia, which considers Kosovo as part of its territory, is one of the main obstacles in the paths of both governments towards EU membership. 
I don't know which criteria applies to decide whether a territory is a state or not, whether one, even the largest member of the EU, thinks so, whether they all think so, or is it based on a membership in the UN. We will have to fight as hard as possible to protect our states and national interests. Kosovo unilaterally declared its independence in 2008. However, five EU member states have refused to accept this. It constitutes another hurdle to the hopeful nation's application. More news around the globe. Stay tuned after this short commercial break. Welcome back to World News Tonight. Now, judges in Peru have ruled that former President Pedro Castillo be held in preventive detention for 18 months pending trial on charges of rebellion and conspiracy for his attempt to shutter Congress and rule by decree as the death toll from a week of violent protests sparked by his ousting rose to at least 15. Supporters of Peru's detained former leader Pedro Castillo gathered outside his prison on Thursday angry after the Supreme Court ruled that he must remain behind bars for an extended 18 months. Demonstrators held up banners, criticizing new president Dina Bolarte and calling for Congress to be shut down. Earlier in the day, a judge deemed Castillo, who has been charged with rebellion and conspiracy, to pose a flight risk and extended his pre-trial detention. The left-wing leader was removed by an overwhelming vote of lawmakers just hours after he tried to dissolve Congress on December the 7th. Bellati says Austin Castillo was lawful and has described his actions as an attempted coup. Protesters across the country have reacted angrily to his removal from office and authorities say at least 15 people have been killed. In the capital, Lima, demonstrators clashed with police on Thursday throwing objects at the officers who returned fire with tear gas. Los nos han encerrado. This protester said she only narrowly escaped when the police surrounded them and that women and children had been affected by the gas. <laughs> Demonstrators also continued to block roads in support of the impeached former president. Just a day earlier, the government imposed a state of emergency to try to quell the unrest. The measure grants special powers to the armed forces and police and limits freedoms, including the right to assembly. Late on Thursday, the government imposed a curfew on 15 local provinces, mostly in rural and in regions. A group of Azerbaijanians claimed to be environment activists blocked the Lakhine Corridor, the only land route for people, goods, food and medical supplies to reach Nagorno-Karabakh from Armenia across Azerbaijani territory. At the start of this week, Armenian Prime Minister Nikol Pashinyan said that the closure of the passage was a gross violation of a 2020 peace agreement between Baku and Yerevan and that the population of the enclave had been made into hostages. This photo shows Azerbaijani protesters blocking the Lachin Corridor, the sole artery connecting Armenia with the majority ethnic Armenian enclave of Nagorno-Karabakh. The group blocked the highway on Monday morning, purportedly against the illegal exploitation of minerals by Armenians from the region. The Azerbaijan government in a statement blamed Russian peacekeepers for the road being shut, which Moscow denies. It is unacceptable to create problems for citizens. I also need to comment separately on two unfounded blaming of and provocative actions towards the Russian peacekeepers. Wherever they come from, we think they are unacceptable and counterproductive. Russian peacekeepers serve as guarantors of stability in the region. Azerbaijani troops moved into the city of Lachin, located in the corridor in August. And Azerbaijan also cut off gas supplies to Nagorno-Karabakh as temperatures plummet. In Armenia, politicians accuse Baku of trying to make life unbearable for civilians. Residents of Nagorno-Karabakh are deprived of the right to free movement. A thousand people, including children, remained on the roads in these cold conditions. Many families were separated, whose members remained on different sides of the blockade. Many people who had severe medical problems were deprived of the necessary medication and medical services. 
Since Azerbaijan defeated Armenia in a 2020 war, the five-kilometre-wide corridor has been the only link between Armenia and Nagorno-Karabakh, which is ruled by a breakaway government unrecognised internationally. The United States and the European Union have also called for the corridor to be reopened. Thousands of Turks swarmed a central Istanbul square in solidarity with the city's opposition mayor after he was banned from politics ahead of the year's presidential election. Chanting slogans criticizing President Erdogan and his AK party, thousands of Ekrem Imamoglu supporters rallied for the second day in a row to denounce his conviction and political ban. We came here today so we can continue to live in a country ruled by the law. We think the law has been violated. We came to defend our rights and the votes of Istanbul residents. Istanbul's mayor is widely seen as the strongest rival against President Erdogan in the country's general election in June of next year. On Wednesday, an Istanbul court convicted him of insulting members of Turkey's Supreme Electoral Council during a speech in 2019. He called those who had annulled the initial vote, which had seen him defeat an APK opponent, fools. A rerun vote saw Imamoglu win comfortably, ending the AKP's 25-year hold on Istanbul. The court sentenced him to two years and seven months in prison and imposed a political ban, which would bar him from running for president. The verdict has been widely criticized in Turkey and abroad as a breach of democracy and free speech. The ruling party ordered a certain verdict to be issued by the court. They wanted to imprison me. Furthermore, when they realized that the original judge would not give the decision they wanted, they exiled him and brought in another judge to decide. Imamoglu's allies allege that his conviction is an attempt by the ruling party to sabotage any competition ahead of next year's election. For now, Imamoglu can continue to serve until the appeals court either confirms or rejects his conviction. South African President Cyril Ramaphosa is expected to win re-election as the leader of his party this weekend after he was paired impeachment proceedings over a scandal involving millions of dollars found stashed in the sofas at his private farm. South Africa Cyril Ramaphosa will face a vote from his party on whether he will represent them in the 2024 elections. This came after he narrowly escaped being forced out by a scandal over millions of dollars found at his private farm. Delegates from the Governing African National Congress, or ANC, will meet in Johannesburg from Friday until Tuesday to decide on their candidate. Historically, that decides who leads the country. If Ramaphosa loses, that may open the door to a rival ANC faction allied to ex-leader Jacob Zuma, who is being investigated for grand corruption. Zuma denies wrongdoing. Should Ramaphosa survive the vote, he will need to resuscitate a party that is less popular than at any time since Nelson Mandela led it to victory in the country's first free elections in 1994, or risk losing its majority in parliament. Last month, the report by a panel of experts found preliminary evidence Ramaphosa may have violated the constitution over a stash of foreign currency hidden at his private game farm. It was a blow for a man who narrowly won his ANC mandate in 2017 on a promise to clean up endemic corruption. Yet the party's response has been to rally round the president and resist calls by opposition politicians for him to quit. For now, Ramaphosa still leads the race, with over 2,000 votes from nearly 4,000 ANC branches. Compared to 916 for ex-health minister Zweli Mkinze, the ANC also faces mounting discontent over joblessness, poor service delivery and chronic power shortages. And last year, it saw its share of the vote drop below half for the first time in municipal polls. Welcome back to World News Tonight and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. 
Tesla boss Elon Musk disclosed another $3.6 billion in stock sales this week, taking his total near $40 billion this year and frustrating investors as the company shares of wallow at the two-year lows. Foreign Minister Park Jin told a file grossly that the government appreciates the agency's role in monitoring North Korea's nuclear program. He added that Seoul looks forward to continuing working together to completely denuclearize the regime. Spain's parliament passed a sexual and reproductive health law that allows girls aged 16 and 17 to undergo abortions without parental consent, a first for a European country. 2022 has been a bumpy ride for many electric vehicle startups. In 2023, they will have to face up to increasing competition from established automakers who are finally switching their focus from gas to EVs. The Senate passed a new bill that would stop government devices from accessing TikTok due to security concerns with China. A separate bipartisan bill would ban TikTok altogether in the United States. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again on Monday for more news around the globe. And in case you missed to watch any of the stories we aired tonight, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. Now, Colombia's capital looked like a scene out of a Christmas movie as the multicolored lights of the Christmas train illuminated the streets of Bogota. We are leaving you tonight with merry youngsters and families all aboard on the steam-powered train for a Christmas-themed trip. Thank you for watching us. Good night and have a lovely chilled weekend.